Okay, so this is part two of the uh, lecture on digital gaming. I just want to do a quick run through of sort of history of video gaming, which gives us some indication and context of where we're at, especially as we're entering a new generation of consoles. Oh, well, now I'm recording this on the 28th of September. So about six weeks away from the launch of PlayStation 5. So, um, and you guys might be watching this after PlayStation 5 has come on. So um, it's an interesting time just to step back and have a look at the concept of the history of video games. And indeed, try and chart not just where we've come from and you know, possibly where we're heading, but how that history has allowed video games to build this capacity for virtual worlds. So very early video game history can be traced back to pinball machines in the 1930s. And you might think, okay, well, pinball machine isn't a video game. No, and I'm not arguing that it was. But what the pinball machine industry did, it created the production, distribution, and consumer channels, which were actually used by early video games as they came around in the 60s and 70s. So the model for how you might create a market for and an industry around video games is borrowed from the pinball industry, um, which emerged in the 1930s. So our early sort of coin operated companies were all established in Japan, but actually by foreign companies. So Taito, which was Sega and Rosen, which became Sega Enterprises. Uh, 1966 Periscope, these machines uh, were imported to the US and Europe and they were expensive, but they set that idea of a 25 cent price for coin operating machines, which became the standard for how the video game industry really began as a money making industry in the 60s and 70s. Really what I'm arguing here is that sort of all sorts of developments in video games can be mirrored back to sort of pinball industry you have overseas companies developing hardware and we see that today even with sony right and the playstation 5 but also particularly in the history of video games companies like sega and nintendo were based in japan and their markets were huge in the us and europe um so they're importing if you like the hardware and much of the software that went on in digital gaming um very expensive machines that doesn't change uh, setting up so we have the huge distribution channel and the idea of digital games being a global sort of um, media in that way was set really before digital gaming even existed so you the, the sort of the economic and distribution channels of gaming were all around before gaming of this kind even existed in different types in terms of the history of video games specifically, in the US, the use of computers for gaming was beginning post Second World War. Uh, so in 1948, the cathode ray tube amusement device patent for electronic game came around. Basically, you had vacuum tubes that controlled missiles firing at a target. This would, have been, this would have been an incredibly intricate and massive, huge thing where you had a set of vacuum tubes that would literally push out uh, and you would look at this onto, um, on a screen in front of you. Incredibly boring, incredibly dull, incredibly primitive, incredibly expensive and incredibly huge. Uh, in 51, when transistors replaced vacuum tubes at, um, in university computers, students started to want games. So you start to see the emergence of video games like checkers and um, tic-tac-toe in the early 50s, where you see the advancement of screen technology is followed by a desire for people to play on these screens. So we're talking 70 years ago and the desire to see video games and indeed the first real video games start to emerge 70 years ago. Now the first discernible game though, the game that most historians would say, yeah, that was the game, right? Really comes around in 1961, Space War by Steve Russell. Um, so this came about by uh, Massachusetts Institute, Institute of Technology students wanting to test the capabilities of their new DEC PDP-1 machine. Um, and the way they tested it was by developing a game called Space War. Let me see a screenshot of Space War here now. Um, Space War actually became a kind of model for games throughout the 60s and 70s. A lot of games came out which were very similar to Space War. Um, that game was widely distributed by DEC. But other games were not distributed because you didn't have, at that point, the facilities to distribute games. Most people didn't, you know, I'm not just talking about most people. 
nearly everyone didn't have a computer. They were all basically stationed in um, universities or research institutes of that kind. And I'm sure Reese has been through uh, this stuff with you in other parts of the module as well. When he's looked at the history of and development of uh, computers themselves, and indeed. If you think back to MS120 last year um, and Reese's lecture in that, you know, very detailed charting through of what happened with regards to the development of the personal computer. But if you like, space war became popular in this very, very niche way. You know, anyone, you know, people who, who had the facilities to play it, they played space war. Uh, in terms of commercialization, though, obviously, Space War wasn't a massive commercial hit because people didn't have the hardware. So the clone of Space War called Galaxy Game, which came around in 1971, uh, developed uh, in Stanford University and they put a machine in, in, the, um, in the student union in Stanford University, 10 cents a game, and people played it like crazy. You know, and into the student union with their 10 cent pieces and pumped it full of this and this machine was just filling up with 10 cents, 10 cents, 10 cents. It gives you the idea that actually there's a desire and a demand outside of, if you like, the uh, sort of knowledge based elite or epistemological elite around computers that, you know, people will be interested in playing these games. That machine sat in um, Stanford University um, Student Union for, ten year, for eight years um, and really a very, very primitive clone of Space War itself, probably not as sophisticated as Space War even, which is not a sophisticated game. Um, and if you don't believe me on that, you can play it online. You know, <laughs> you, could, you know, just type Space War into Google. It will bring you a, a clone of Space War. Um, in terms of commercialization, an important historical example of like, oh, there's money to be made here. Um, in terms of where we go, in terms of history, uh, Ralph Bayer and the um, in 1967 sort of creating a machine to play games or a number of different games on a singular machine. So we already see a divergence from what we would call the arcade model, where you have one machine that people all play the same game, to a machine which could run multiple different games or different pieces of software on the same piece of hardware. So this prototype played multiple games, no sound, um, three dials for you know the, the, um, the Magnavox machine when it was finally bought off by um, Magnavox controller is an insane piece of kit three dials for vertical horizontal and spin around so you move the dials there's no like joypad or anything like that. it's a crazy interface uh, and you had like really basic things like light gun shooting paddles for tennis and things like that um you know i think this is really really stupid but it's the first instance of a machine the magnavox where you could plug in video games at home and play them over your television and you know, it's a huge, huge step forward in the commercialization of video games to actually bring video games to a legitimate household audience. We're talking late 60s, early 70s. Now in the arcades though, in the 70s, the arcades remained the major space for growth. So uh, in 1972, Atari uh, and um, the interesting things around one of the classic video games of all time, Pong, uh, again, Pong, you can play online. It, it, it's kind of mesmerizing Pong. It's not, you know, it is literally flippers going up and down the screen and you're playing ping pong, hence the name Pong, right? But it's it's kind of mesmeric. And I don't know how intention spans are with people these days. And, you know, you probably give up after five, ten minutes. But it's an interesting thing to go and play anyway. And so there's loads of instances of Pong online. Um, so in 72, um, you know, Pong sort of comes out, um, Atari's first game engineer, Al, Al Cohen, sort of develops Pong. Atari tried to get Bally's to manufacture it. Bally's was big manufacturer of things like, you know, uh, pinball machines, even like um, uh, uh, bubblegum um, distributors, you know, trying to tap into a, a company that has a couple of things going for it, a massive distribution network and has experience of using coin-operated machines in particular ways. So, you know, the manufacturing process for that is great. The machines often malfunction. Indeed, during demos, the machines that malfunction very often because they got too full of coins. This game was insane. People played it for hours and hours on end on a single quarter, but people would pump quarters into these machines. 
and you know it became a huge commercial hit. Um, on the basis of that, Atari decided to forget Bally's and go into manufacturing themselves, and this became the foundation for the Atari company to become the biggest gaming company in the world up until the early 80s. Copywriting was an issue with this. It's very difficult actually to copyright the concept of ping, you know, ping pong. Uh, so a lot of um, competitors emerged, a lot of cheap sort of knockoffs emerged of this in arcades. It, you know, the variations of a theme, but it became really the first huge video game hit would be Pong. Now, um, what I want to say before talking any more about this is um, if we look at the development of games in the 70s, what we're missing, obviously, is this rich, immersive world that I was talking about in, um, in the first lecture, because Pong, for all its, you know, technological sophistication of the time, it ain't a world. You didn't have characters, you know, you didn't really even have graphics of any kind whatsoever. It's a video game experience, but it's a very particular video game experience. It's a hugely bounded experience. You're just doing one thing. It's really very closely aligned to what I think Huizinga would have called the um, magic circle of play back in the 30s. You know, this is a step out from everyday life where you're doing one particular activity. And it hasn't got the richness or diversity of games as we consider them today. As games develop in the 70s, you start to see new themes of games. You move away from like ping pong, um, so you see a lot of battle games such as tank, uh, pursuit games, driving and racing. In 1976, Night Driver is the first sit-down cabinet. And you might have said, ooh, that's interesting. Why Night Driver? Well, of course, the graphics um, at that time mean you can't have a backlit screen, so it's easier to put it at night, basically. Um, Breakout um, was basically a subversion of Pong where you use a ball to smash a wall ahead of you made of bricks. So they just took basically what Pong is like, you know, a flipper going up and down the side of the screen, flip that down so it's at the bottom of the screen. You've got a ball there, and instead of playing against a AI an opponent, you are just hitting against a wall. It's kind of interesting how these um, games have like common roots to one another and just minor variations. When I talk about Pac-Man in a while, that become really obvious. Um, Death Race in 76. Some of these titles are brilliant, like Tank, Death Race. You know, um, you can see that they're appealing to a particular demographic games in the 70s as well. Um, so... Still in the arcades. 1978, Space Invaders by Tato. The idea that high scores become a cultural commodity in society. Space Invaders was, was huge, bigger than anything that had come before. And to have your high score on Space Invaders, to be the high score person in your local chippy or something like that on Space Invaders, you, you'd, you'd made it. You know, you'd made it in life at that point. You had respect of your peers. Space Invaders, I mean, again, if you've never played Space Invaders, go on to Google, search for Space Invaders. You can have a game of Space Invaders. Uh, you're basically a sort of uh, character. You're not even a character, really. You're just kind of set sprites at the bottom of the screen. You're firing up at the aliens as they're coming down the screen to you and the purpose of the game is to is to clear the screen of aliens before they get right down to the bottom of the screen and then you die yeah i know it's not sophisticated you know so on but this is 1978 and space invaders became it not just having a high score in space invaders becoming a cultural commodity but space invaders became a legitimate cultural phenomena at that point in time as well. It would be huge. People were playing Space Invaders like crazy, massive sort of thing. In 79, Starfire, um, you had the first instance of using initials to save your high scores, so your high score would remain over time. So you, you could be preserved forever using sort of really primitive sort of um, ROM chips in um, in consoles at that time, in you know um, consoles within uh, arcade machines. <clears throat> In 79, you get Atari football, so smooth scroll and screen, I should say screen, not scree, the stuff that comes off a of glacier, uh, and a trackball controller. So you start to see more sophistication in the arcades, different types of games coming along, different types of gaming interface where you've got different types of movement. You're not just moving backwards and forwards on a screen anymore in a very limited way. You're starting to move up and down and across and so on. 
And in the late 70s, thanks to the success of things like Space Invaders, you see a huge number of companies start to enter the business. In particular, you know, huge ones which are still around today, Konami, Namco, SNK, Technos, people like that. You know, big video game companies start to emerge thanks to this boom in um, arcade machines. And they've got a sense of, you know, permanence over time, those companies as well. So, 1980, Namco, Pac-Man. Originally called Pac-Man, but changed name before release into the US. And you don't have to be a genius to realize why that was. I mean, if you're a very amusing person and you decided to just, you know, erase part of the P uh, in Pac-Man, you'd have a hugely hilarious thing uh, that that would say. So they changed it to Pac-Man. It became the best-selling arcade game up to that point, and really the first game with an identifiable, identifiable character. And you're probably all familiar with what Pac-Man looks like, and he is just a big circle, basically, with a bit cut out of that circle like a pizza. Um, Pac-Man makes the cover of Time magazine. Um, and, you know, uh, again, I would encourage you to play Pac-Man in its original form, which you can do online, just play in Pac-Man. There's loads of emulators out there. I just feel like I'm repeating the point here. Um, Pac-Man is it's cute. You know, it's, it's great. I used to find it intensely frustrating. I used to be pretty good at it, but um, it does get really frustrating at times. And you do get that sort of video game rage where you want to throw things when you play it sometimes. Uh, it, you totally can't play it on your mobile phone, by the way. There's loads of Pac-Man things, especially if you've got an Android phone. Uh, it just does not work on a mobile phone at all because you need a joystick to play it properly. Um, the important thing for us is the idea of a video game character, uh, you know, the idea of an identifiable character, no matter how primitive it was. And of course, the ghosts became uh, identifiable characters as well. Um, in 81, a group of MIT students did some enhancement kits for Pac-Man and ended up producing Ms. Pac-Man. And the difference between Pac-Man and Ms. Pac-Man, she has a bow and um, she becomes really the first identifiable female character of all time as well which is kind of cool you know at least you know we were thinking about female characters as well although i would like to you know to make this a point that you know the, these guys only did that because they didn't want to get sued badly by namco um interestingly if you've seen if you have netflix and um there's a documentary called high score as well and it gives you much more detail on that story about um ms pac-man and pac-man um, Nintendo started to become a player after this. 81, Donkey Kong, uh, 82, Donkey Kong Jr. induced uh, this very, you know, minor and, you know, not particularly successful character called uh, Mario. Um, Nintendo really is an important innovator in the video game and digital gaming field because of their early and persistent emphasis on character. You know, Nintendo were different to other companies that were developing games uh, at that time because they had a real focus on characterization both donkey kong himself and mario himself they had you know they were trying to inject personality into gaming so they they become huge game donkey kong becomes huge uh, in the early 80s as well so in the home what's going on there i've talked a lot about um Consoles around, uh, sorry, uh, I've talked nothing about consoles, I've talked about arcades uh, in the 70s and early 80s. In the home, what's going on? One thing to say is, at that point, there's no real way to make effective home transfers until the early 80s. And in the 1980s, in fact, the, the arcade industry would far outstrip the home console industry for a long, long time. And it took a long time, really into the 90s, for what technology we had in the home to catch up with arcades. It was a big difference over time. Um, you start to see some things. You start to see handheld tic-tac-toe, for example, in 72. So emergence of what later is going to become the Switch, I suppose, that long lineage up to the uh, Nintendo Switch. In 76, you start to see the emergence of game cartridges. So you can buy software on a particular piece of kit. So you can have more than one game at one time. Vector graphics start to emerge, and then we see the Atari 2600 come out in 1979, which is a major, major thing. And the 2600 became a huge selling console until the ET game came along and actually trashed the entire home video game industry for a year in um, 1983. In 83, you start to see um, the emergence of new forms of digital game storage, such as Laserdisc, for example. And uh, there's a long lag here, really, but you know that kind of storage. 
emerges in the 80s but only really becomes a huge factor in gaming when the PlayStation 1 comes out around 1995. 82, Electronic Arts emerges as a major publisher purely for home, the home environment. Um, PCs and gaming on PC starts to become popular around the same time and the Commodore 64, which is like this hybrid machine, which was, you know, you could use it for work, you could use it for spreadsheets, you could use it for word processing, but you could also use it for games. That emerges in 82. We start to see a boom in home gaming around that time. So before that, gaming was restricted to sort of primitive looking you know, cartridge-based machines like the Atari 2600. Yes, very popular, but games limited, very, very limited in terms of the depth and the quality of graphics and so on. Commodore 64 marks a big difference in this. In 83, you start to see the first networked games come out. They're text-based, but, you know, Maze War and games like that are, you know, sort of the first sort of networked online games. You start to see handheld consoles emerge in the as well and then the whole thing comes crashing down in 83 as i just alluded to and again um high score on netflix has a very nice piece on et the extraterrestrial um but basically what you have in 1983 is too many companies and far and much more important too many bad games so you had a lot of companies involved in the home space atari would be the biggest but you need a lot of competitors to them which meant the whole industry was kind of thinly spread out across different things if you could buy a console and because the industry is so thinly spread out, you bought a console and there's not like not that many games in them. But the worst thing of all was the games were dreadful. And E.T. is, I don't know if it's the worst game of all time, right? That's a hell of a claim to make. But I, I actually have uh, E.T. on an emulator. Um, and it, it's not so much that it's bad. And it is bad. You know, it is really bad. But it's also pointless. There's no discernible way of discovering what you're supposed to do in that game. So you control E.T. and it's a, it, it, E.T. just looks awful in it. And I, for the life of me, and I've played it so many times, so I can't work out what you're supposed to do. No idea. Um, brought out in 83 to kind of capitalise on the huge success of E.T. as a film in 1983. Rushed. Done in a couple of months, and so Monfort and Bogos have got a great account of this in their book. But there's also a really good account in High School on uh, Netflix, the documentary, the first episode, I think, of that documentary. Um, Tari went crazy and just like printed so many cartridges of this game. The early buzz was not good. The buzz when people actually bought it, the few people that did actually buy this game, was terrible, and it crashed Atari as a company. Uh, they put so much money into E.T. that literally it destroyed them as a company because they couldn't shift all these games. So they, you know, reasonably speaking, um, those games were expensive to produce at the time. They were, you know, in, compared to today, we're not really talking that much. But the physical cost of the, the actual cartridges was quite a lot for a company like Atari. And they pumped a lot of money into producing as many of these games as possible, expecting them to fly out of the shops and literally nobody bought them. So they've got a sunk cost into this capital that they've put into the, um, producing this cartridge. Nobody's buying it. In the end, they buried them in a hole. <laughs> like the Atari company itself, it just got buried in a hole in New Mexico. And you can actually, um, the, the, the hole was found a few years ago and people excavated the games. The games still work unbelievably, um, but um, yeah, the game still sucks. Uh, and that crash kind of lasted a year. But it really, what it marked the crash importantly was, um, and it wasn't just Atari that was taken down, it was a load of other companies as well. It cleared the space for a new sort of dominance to emerge. And really what you see after the crash is the dominance of Nintendo, the emergence of Sega as a competitor to Nintendo, and then this kind of duopoly model um, that goes on throughout gaming where two big companies compete with each other. So when we talk of consoles, we're talking in generations, the first gen, Magnavox, the Coleco, these sort of things, second gen, and all these generations overlap. Okay, and we're going to get that overlap very shortly. We're going to get a new generation with PlayStation 5 and whatever Microsoft are calling um, the Xbox these days. I'm not an Xbox player, but, um, you know, the, the, 
they kind of lost me a while ago, Microsoft. Um, so the second gen overrides the first gen. So we see the Bally Astrocade, Atari 2600 being the big one there, the Odyssey 2, not much of an improvement on the Odyssey 1. The third gen is the longest lasting generation, right? The third generation of machines. The, unbelievably, they were still producing games for the NES and uh, until like 2003. This is incredible, 20 years. So you had the, the original NES, the Nintendo Entertainment System, Sega Master System, Commodore 64, and this was really the huge breakthrough in gaming came here. Fourth gen starts around 87 and last, and again, an incredible long time, last till 2004. Although I should add, most of these things became obsolete around 94, 95. So Super Nintendo, Sega Mega Drive, Neo Geo, um, Sega Mega CD, so this is the first sort of CD stories as a peripheral to the Sega Mega Drive. And again, you can, you can see between these things, right? So you've got Magnavox versus Coleco to begin with. You've got Magnavox, Coleco and Atari fighting it out with each other. Nintendo and Sega in these two generations battling it out. You may not have heard of these other ones, right? Neo Geo, PC Engine, things like that. They were legitimate machines in that fourth generation, but the big players were these two, um, Nintendo and Sega. So when you hit the fifth gen, you know, Sega and Nintendo are still there, right? The Saturn and uh, the 64. Uh, but Sony come along and really start to blow the pair of them away at that point. Um, sixth gen, PlayStation 2, um, the GameCube, the Dreamcast, the Xbox, Microsoft come along. At that point, really, Nintendo and Sega drop out and it becomes a contest between Microsoft and Sony. PlayStation 2 becomes the biggest selling console of all time. And indeed, the, the, um, the PS4 is not now going to overtake PlayStation 2. It doesn't look. It's going to fall about 40 million units short, something like that. Whether the PlayStation 5 will shift that many units, I'm really sceptical about, because I think we're going to have a change towards online gaming. It seems like saved Sony are still going to have physical machines. I, I don't expect it to sell as many as the PS4. Um, and you see a change in this duopoly. Uh, at that sixth gen moment, 98, 99, so PlayStation comes out, and the PlayStation 2 comes out in 99, it goes up against the Dreamcast and kind of blows Sega away, which is a real shame actually, because the Dreamcast was a great machine, including, you know, innovations like um, having a built-in modem, the first um, video game home console that had a built-in modem for network games, for example, had fab games on it, just it was never going to cut it against PlayStation 2. And PlayStation 2 also had a DVD player integrated as well, which was massive at the time. Um, as we move forward into the 7th gen, what's interesting here, okay, Sega drop out. Nintendo become a really, really niche company from that point onwards. The, the uh, GameCube did not do well. It got blown away by the Xbox and the PlayStation 2. So when we hit 7th gen around 2005, and again, there's like a 12-year cycle in this one, 360 versus the PlayStation 3, that became the big battle. And the Wii really targeted different sort of people. You know, it looked at families, it looked at female gamers, and not necessarily female gamers here, it looked at like women who don't play games but might be interested in a video game system that can do certain things. So it was a really interesting positioning. We sold a hell of a lot of units, um, and but never sold games, really, in the same way that Xbox 360 and PS3 did. Firstly, because it was difficult to get games onto that system because of the way the controllers work. But secondly, as well, it wasn't marketed towards people who would play Grand Theft Auto 3, 4, 5, for example. It was not for those people. It was for a very different set of people. The eighth gen, which started and will go on for a while, you know, it's not going to die in a few weeks' time. But I think this cycle is going to be one that is probably the shortest since the 70s. I don't expect that cycle to extend much longer than 2022, so about a decade. Uh, PS4, the Xbox One, uh, the Wii U, which was a dreadful machine. Um, the Switch, which has you know, really redeemed Nintendo in a lot of ways, but it's a handheld, really. Um, the PS4 blew everything away in this generation. So Sony's in dominant position now. We're in kind of in a position at the moment where we've got one dominant player for the first time since the 80s when Sega was trying to come at the Nintendo Entertainment System. It was really struggling. Um, but it got there in the end. Um, I think Sony have won this generation so comprehensively that they're in a really good position for the next generation, albeit... Do we want to stump up 500 quid for a Blu-ray player and a video game console? We've got to wait to see yet, right? Really, those are the console generations. So we're going to hit Generation 9, really, in a few weeks' time. It's going to be really exciting.
What happens between these generations is really, really interesting. So if I, if I take, for example, uh, the fifth gen there, um, PS1 generation. Well, what are the features of that generation of games? Well, the 64 actually still had cartridges. Uh, the Saturn and the PlayStation transferred their games onto DVD technology or CD technology at the time. So more storage, there were much more powerful processors than the generation that came before. So what happens on that move then to the sixth? Okay, well, all of those things run on disc-based media, no cartridges anymore. So we see an evolution over time from cartridge to disc, etc., etc. Seventh gen run on Blu-ray. Um, you start to see networking come in, but it's it's small in the sixth generation. It's ubiquitous by the seventh generation. Yeah. So you see these features which emerge in one generation become the whole focus of the next generation and so on and so forth. So what are we going to see in generation nine? Obviously, it's going to be networked, but actually there's going to be less digital media because what you see in generation eight is more of a reliance on things like the, you know, the PSN store, for example. Um, that's going to be huge and you're going to be able to buy consoles which have no physical media storage at all you know you know you can buy you'll be able to buy a playstation 5 that has no disk drive at all and you're just going to be buying digital games so you see the con convergence there between sort of mobile technology how you know um apple have been running their stuff over the years and how uh, you know, the android store works and how video games work and i've got a mixture of those things personally but you know i do find it convenient to buy digital games but i kind of still like the disc and with backwards compatibility i'm gonna to have to get a ps5 that can run ps4 as well we see evolution really the generations of video games are all about evolution you see features emerge in each generation that kind of become solid core parts of the next generation but you then see little things emerge in the next generation which become the part of the next one after that uh, in terms of handhelds, you know, handhelds have got a really, really rich history. We're in Switch now, which is a hybrid handheld because you can play a handheld, but you don't have to. Um, the big features for me, I mean, Microvision were the first handheld system with interchangeable cartridges. It's 79, you know, it's a huge history. The Game Boy was massive. 118.69 million units of Game Boy sold. Wow. I had one constant companion for a few years when I was about 10, 11. Um, monochrome screen, ROM cartridges. Cartridges were really cheap. And the key word with the Game Boy was one, Tetris. Everyone in the world fell for Tetris. Everyone went crazy about Tetris. You start to see color screens with the Game Gear and the Lynx. But the problem with those systems was I mean, they were so battery hungry. You'd have to put like six batteries and you got like two hours of gameplay out of them. It was ridiculous. Um, Really, though, you see with handheld systems, um, little, you know, so the early 90s, you see a lot, and then nothing really happened for a long time. You had sort of variations, Color Game Boy, for example, yeah, throughout the 90s, but then you have to wait until Nintendo come along with the DS in 2004. 154 million units of the DS sold, that's a crazy number. Um, Sony tried the PSP Portable, doesn't really. That was a terrible system. Uh, DS, uh, 3DS um, starts off digital, digital games and starts to latch on to mobile phone technology. And we're at the Switch. Handheld systems are interesting to me in terms of how they follow the evolutionary cycle of um, development in video game platforms, but they're much, much more spaced out. And it does point to us that, you know, the home based system has become dominant. Although the Switch is a really interesting machine, but in terms of sales, it's nothing like the PS4. I mean, you know, it, it's not even comparing, comparing it. So when we think about this history of video games, what, what, how can we pull all this together? So I looked at Brian Arthur's book, um, The Nature of Technology, uh, what it is and how it evolves. The evolution of technology is uh, built upon the ideas and functions of existing technology. So things are always being improved and refined rather than, you know, being plucked from thin air. OK, so. The development of the PS4 comes from the PS1, 2, and 3. Is you know, PS4 never came out new. You know, the, you know, nobody was, you know, there's no grand invention here. It's just a series of evolutions that Sony have been working on from the PS1 as they've got new chips, new storage, new um, optical media, etc., new ways of doing graphics. That becomes PS2, that becomes PS3, that becomes PS4. And what's interesting when we think about evolution is how. Video game systems become the survival of the fittest. 
the technology that best fits the needs and demands of the time and the overall infrastructure in which these things are happening will succeed. So, for example, the Super Nintendo system in Sega succeeded rather than the Neo Geo. And you might ask, OK, like, what was wrong with the Neo Geo? It was so expensive. The Neo Geo like, console in the early 90s cost like six, seven hundred pounds and games for it cost a hundred quid. It just never was going to work. The games were way, way better in terms of graphics, in terms of sound and in terms of depth on the Neo Geo than they were on the Super Nintendo and Sega when it launched. But what happened, because it cost so much to do, cost so much to buy, it cost so much to develop for that platform, that, you know, the, companies like EA, for example, they just wouldn't bother with the Neo Geo. They were never going to sell anything. It didn't cost them so much money. So they developed for the Super Nintendo and Sega, as opposed to that. And the Neo Geo just dies. You know, and we saw this with Xbox One and PS4 rather than the Wii U. Nobody could work out what the Wii U was for. It wasn't a Wii. It wasn't a proper gaming console it was kind of this hybrid in between thing which never fitted the time and it just it just disappeared after about six months nobody wanted it so i mean when we think about you know what platforms work and what platforms don't work what companies work what they don't it's those that understand the needs of the time best of all which is why it, i think sony are taking a massive gamble by keeping you know the ps5 in the form that it's going to come out with i'm not sure if it fits but we you know everyone was talking up uh, google's gaming system recently and that doesn't really seem to fit yet but it's gonna be an interesting time to see who wins out on this um and also in terms of evolution there's the will the drive and intentions and the innovators to see their visions make made concrete and for that you, you know ask why microsoft and sony entered the market in the 1990s and why they dominate we're asking questions about the political economy of gaming. Sony and Microsoft looked at gaming as a, you know, gaming in the early 90s was a massive, massive moneymaker. Nintendo and Sega were rich companies because lots of people bought their machines and lots of people bought games on their machines. It was a huge, huge industry. But those companies themselves were tiny, <laughs> minuscule dots compared to Microsoft and Sony. So Microsoft and Sony made deliberate decisions. Sony were actually working very closely with Nintendo in the early 90s. Um, but they looked at those companies and just the size of them and thought, well, if we actually get into this environment, we could wipe them out and take all that money because we're already huge compared to them. Much bigger, we can produce things cheaper, we can produce better quality stuff. We are manufacturing, we are, you know, state-of-the-art manufacturers. Not so much Microsoft, but they had state-of-the-art sort of capabilities in software, obviously. And I think, yeah, we can take them down. They had the will to kill off Sega and Nintendo, for, for which for a retro gamer like me is really, really sad because I loved Sega and Nintendo. And Nintendo still exists, but they are third wheel. You know, they're, they're, they're nothing like as big as uh, Sony and Microsoft and they're never going to be again. So in terms of how we think about how video games work through history, we have to think about this concept of evolution. We have to think about the constant refinement of things like an evolutionary idea, survival of the fittest, what fits best with society at that point in time, and this idea of an evolutionary will. Those that want to dominate can dominate. Okay, part three, we'll talk more about virtual worlds and that kind of stuff. Cool.